Hello and welcome back to the channel Airbus uh, What's It Doing Now and uh, to this episode Take Care of Your Brakes which is a article in a rec or recent article from Airbus Safety uh, Magazine. I'm going to go into that uh, in just a second but just before I do that uh, just a reminder about the members uh, area of this channel. I've had lots of questions uh, here and on Facebook and various places asking me how to join. Um, it's uh, pretty straightforward although I believe on some um, um, Safari, on Macs and uh, Apple devices sometimes you can't see the join button but if you're on a PC head of the channel hit the join button it'll take you through the process there uh, if you are on an apple product if you if you're on an apple device an iphone um, it won't show so you'll need to select the desktop site uh, in order to see that okay uh, then you'll be um, then you'll be in on the channel uh, what's it all about well you'll have access to all of the uh, videos i think we're up to about 100 now uh, so lots of tech on there if you're preparing for your command or if you're preparing for your lpc opc uh, hopefully you'll find uh, something in there of uh, use to you. It's a fiver uh, for a month subscription and you can come in and out of it uh, whenever you want. So it's uh, really uh, very flexible. So hope you enjoy that side of the channel. If not, of course, you can stay on the free side and uh, uh, have access to uh, the safety area of the channel and any sort of tear and share uh, articles uh, that uh, that come up. Uh, so what are we going to look at in this article then? Uh, Breakwear A bus safety first, like I say. Now you can read these articles. So the purpose of me doing this is um, that um, I give it a little bit of a breakdown, uh, add some graphics as well to sort of help uh, some of my experience and a bit of a deep dive and further explanation to some of the uh, areas of the articles for you. Um, so this uh, case study concerns uh, failure of a brake pack uh, on an A330 in this case, but the, the, the take homes are uh, broadly the same. Um, we'll take a look at the case study first and we'll take a look at the analysis of the event. We'll take a look at this phenomena called um, oxidization um, or brake wear versus oxidization, what it actually is, both thermal and uh, catalytic, which is a, a phrase I hadn't heard of uh, before. Um, and also the effects of temperature on uh, brake wear. And I've got a, a useful uh, diagram there to help uh, understand that a little bit better. And then lastly, we'll move on to operational considerations uh, for reducing brake wear and uh, brake uh, oxidization. Uh, it comes with a bit of a government health warning, as all of these videos do, in so much as um, operations, so your company operations, your company will give you direction uh, on how they want you to operate the brakes on the aircraft. Uh, it will be uh, in line with FCOM, uh, but there may be some other recommendations your company use with regards to brakes, brake applications, um, and various other efficiencies your company might use to sort of balance fuel and, uh, and brake wear. But anyway, moving on with that operational considerations, walk around and visual inspection and what you can do as, as pilots um, to uh, assess uh, the condition of your brakes. Or look at taxiing, single engine taxi, um, the benefits of. Uh, landing with full flap versus uh, flap three, use of auto brake and the modification on A320s to the new auto brake low function, uh, reverse thrust, its benefits, and also the use of brake fans. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the article first then, and we'll go through all of those areas. There is a chunk on here from the maintenance manual. We don't have access to that. Um, so I'm not going to go into that in huge detail. Uh, if you want to, of course, you can pick up the article and uh, have a look and, and read through that yourself. So the article goes on to say that all brakes are subject to wear. Some brakes may also experience oxidization, uh, which will come on to a little bit later on, uh, which can lead to brake rupture, which was uh, the case in this uh, particular event. 
Uh, in the case of brake uh, rupture, uh, or if the brakes are too worn, uh, the aircraft braking performance is reduced. Uh, this can result in runway overrun if the full braking capacity is required, uh, such as during a rejected takeoff with an aircraft weight at or close to the maximum uh, takeoff weight. Brake rupture can cause uh, or also lead to the damage that can cause a brake uh, fire uh, due to hydraulic fluid coming into contact uh, with the hot parts of the braking uh, and the braking system. The article describes carbon wear and oxidization phenomena and it recalls the maintenance procedures used to identify worn or oxidized brakes and flight crew procedures and good practices to prevent brake wear and uh, oxidization uh, there's some great illustrations here actually which will really help uh, consolidate uh, understanding so let's take a look at the case study first uh, and analysis and then we can look at the terminology and the definitions of, of brake wear versus oxidization etc like we spoke about at the uh, the head of the brief so shortly after landing the flight crew of an a330 aircraft heard a strong and unusual noise uh, during taxiing when the aircraft reached the parking stand, the ground crew uh, observed smoke coming from the area underneath the uh, left main landing gear and then in turn uh, informed the flight crew. Uh, the fire brigade arrived but did not see any signs of fire, just the smoke. The flight crew noticed uh, the brake temperatures had reached 400 uh, degrees centigrade. Maintenance personnel performed a quick inspection of the landing gear, which revealed that one of the brake pistons uh, on that uh, wheel bogey had twisted and dislodged from its housing uh, with evidence of a fluid leak. And you can see that uh, in this photo. I'll, I'll bring it up on the chart. I think I've got a couple here, one on an A330 and another one, I believe, on a Boeing aircraft where a very similar uh, incident occurred and you can see there on the picture right at the bottom there I'll try and circle it for you um, where the piston had actually become dislodged and because it got in touch with those sort of the rotating part of the brake pack brake pack um, uh, that the sort of the the, the linear the sideways motion of, of the rotating mass coming in contact with the piston just pulled the piston right out uh, so yeah that that would have that would have uh, caused some noise for sure. Um, good. So hopefully that just kind of shows you a little bit about how that how that might happen. The investigation showed that the most probable cause was a rupture of the brake pressure plate, which the piston pushes up against uh, to, to engage with the rotating mass of the brakes and to engage the sort of the braking material. The brake piston pushed through the pressure plate and came into contact with the first rotor, the rotating part, uh, hence the name. Um, um, this applied a lateral force to the piston, causing it to be dislodged from its housing and causing uh, the hydraulic fluid leak. Uh, the hydraulic fluid that leaked onto the hot parts of the brake created the smoke. Remember, these were about 400 degrees at this point. And the pressure plate was found to be significantly oxidised, which was the reason it ruptured and the uh, brake piston uh, pressed against it so in this particular case um, the oxidize oxidization of the brake pack was the likely cause of the rupture of that pressure plate uh, which then caused that uh, caused this event and there's a picture here uh, at the bottom um, a figure here which shows the sort of normal configuration of the pressure plates and you'll see there at the bottom i'll try and circle it for you the pressure plate, the first pressure plate, uh, became uh, de deteriorated, which then caused the piston to go onto the rotor and causing it to dislodge. And you can see there that the hydraulic uh, fluid then uh, starts coming out. Now, you're not going to lose all the hydraulic fluid because there are valves in there to prevent that from happening. And these valves um, um, manage flow rate and also of volume as well. But I'll come on to that uh, a little bit um, later on. So that was the event here, uh, hot, you know, hot brakes, fluid uh, onto the hot parts at 400 degrees caused the smoking. The investigation found that a piston become dislodged primarily due to oxidization, which caused a fracture and deterioration of that pressure plate. The piston then coming into contact with uh, the rotor and then dislodging the piston and then hydraulic fluid um, coming out. Excuse me a moment, I'm going to have a sip of my tea. 
Right, okay, breakware versus uh, oxidization. I'm reading this, by the way, from, from my iPad. So you see me looking away, uh, manipulating my hands here. It's, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just reading through stuff. Um, so breakware, breakware is the progressive loss of the width of the brake discs and that, and that, that, that friction material due to the friction. Uh, it's the friction, of course, that causes the deceleration. Uh, and that, of course, in turn, creates heat. The brake wear on the carbon brakes depends on, and this is important, it's the number of brake applications and on the brake temperature. So we'll look at how we can better manage that uh, later on in operational techniques or rep operational recommendations. Each carbon brake has its own temperature range for the optimum operation and its temperature range for uh, maximum wear. And the temperature range varies from one brake manufacturer uh, to another. And I've pulled off an image here um, of the three, if I remember rightly, different types of brake manufacturer and the tables. But you can clearly see, even though the peaks move slightly along the temperature graph there, it's the sort of lower end of things where the, where the brake um, uh, wear is greater. Uh, in the lower temperatures, but then of course it's versus oxidization, which occurs in the in the upper temperatures. But and I'll talk about that more a little bit later on. So guaranteed braking efficiency until the wear limit. Um, brakes are guaranteed to provide sufficient braking until the brake wear indicator is flushed with the reference surface. And this is what you need to look at when you're on your on your walk around. And I've got some images here that show that that uh, wear indicator and the reference plate, which is basically where it protrudes from. I'll show you that anyway. Uh, the indicator is, if the indicator is below the reference surface, the brake discs are too worn and the braking performance can be significantly reduced. I think I've got a picture here of one that is, is, is beneath. If the brake discs are too worn, uh, their width is reduced. Uh, and as a result, uh, the pistons do not have enough extension uh, to push the disc to create sufficient braking to slow the aircraft down. So there just isn't enough um, movement there in order to create that um, braking efficiency. In addition, if the brakes are too warm, the amount of heat sink uh, mass that's available to absorb the brake energy is reduced. Now, what that means is if you've got less meat, there's less energy be able to be absorbed by that brake pad, so then, or the brake pack, so then the temperature is more likely uh, to increase. Again, increasing, decreasing the efficiency uh, and oxidization. The amount of heat sink mass that is available to absorb the brake energy is reduced. In the event of high speed RTO, this can lead to increased risk of overrun or a uh, or a break uh, fire. You can see in this next image here that I've got up for you in this figure uh, presentation, uh, you can see the uh, break wear indicator showing just below uh, the reference plate or the reference surface. Uh, and you can see on the left hand side here, it's protruding and that's where we see it. Uh, all the time pretty much i have seen them very very close to being flush but i've never seen uh, a break wear indicator below the ref i've never seen that uh, and and neither should you so your maintenance teams will keep a close eye on this but it's a good visual inspection and we'll talk about recommendations later on uh, if you see uh, that the reference plate uh, or you see the wear pin flush with the reference plate, that's a time to talk to the uh, your maintenance company. Uh, right, uh, what else have I got on here? I want to picture, illustrate the reference. Yeah, so a few pictures here to show you the reference uh, indicator. So brake oxidization. Um, this looks pretty nasty, doesn't it? And you see some of these images here where the wheel's been, uh, wheel and tire arrangement has been taken off and you can see the brake pack here and you can see all these carbon deposits just mashed around the rotors um, and the stators it's uh, it's quite a mess um, so carbon from the brakes naturally uh, combines with the oxygen from the ambient air to become uh, co2 carbon dioxide so this is a natural phenomena it's not we just can't get away from it when we're using carbon brakes under normal circumstances the oxida oxida oxidation occurs at a very low and predictable rate. However, the rate of oxidation can be accelerated by external factors such as high temperatures and something called catalytic or chemical uh, pollution. And there's a little table here which shows the um, uh, loss 
um, time to loss of 5% of the mass and time to lose 25% of its strength between thermal and thermal and catalytic oxidization. You can see up to 25 degrees, there's next to nothing. Uh, but as soon as you hit four or 500 degrees, it's massive. Um, uh, well, yeah, it is huge. I mean, we're talking about the numbers of days actually to lose 5% of its mass um, uh, in those higher temperatures um, and uh, of both catalytic and thermal. So there's a little table there just to give you a, a visual presentation of just how much this affects the degradation of mass and strength uh, to the um, uh, to the brake pack. This results in loss of carbon mass from the brake discs, carbon softening and delamination. That's where bits come off. Um, it can ultimately lead to the brake rupture uh, if the affected brake is not changed uh, in due time. Uh, figure four, uh, carbon oxidization due, I can't say that word, can I? Oxidation due to exposed high temperatures referred to as thermal oxidation. When carbon oxidation is due to the presence of catalysts, um, it is referred to as catalytic uh, oxidation. So that's in de-icing fluid or some, de I don't know if it's all, but some de-icing fluids but used both on the runway and on airframe de-icing coming into contact uh, with uh, with the brakes. Um, now the de-icing teams know to try and keep that away from the wheels uh, when they're spraying but of course you know it's inevitable that they're going to be exposed to it because in the de-icing areas they're covered with fluid and the wheels are obviously just boating through all this fluid and, and particularly on the runway it's just an avoidable con an unavoidable consequence unfortunately. But the combination of the two obviously work together in degrading the brake efficiency over time depending on temperature uh, as you can see there so these are my, my new glasses i lost my old ones and these are tesco's ones for a tenner and they look like it and they feel like it and i can't quite get them straight on my face um so thermal oxidization occurs the main cause of accelerated degradation of carbon brakes it can occur at high temperatures are reached after landing and during taxi. Thermal oxidation affects all uh, brake discs, but the middle discs are the most affected because they reach a higher temperature and take longer uh, to cool down. Warm brakes tend to reach higher temperatures, making them more prone to the effects of thermal oxidation, which is what we looked at earlier on. Uh, there's less thermal capacity for more worn brakes, and so the temperatures increase much faster, retained for longer, um, and it's the middle part of the pack that's most effective. Now, catalytic uh, oxidation, the brakes are generally caused by contact with de-icing or cleaning fluids. It's the potassium or sodium, that doesn't really matter, but that's what, it's, that's what causes it, coming from some aircraft and runway de-icing fluids, acts as a catalyst to further accelerate the oxidation. I'll show you that table. The presence of the catalyst also reduces the temperature at which the significant oxidation occurs. So, so, so it affects the, 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 the temperature, it lowers the temperature, which you then get thermal oxidation as well. When potassium or sodium is absorbed by the carbon, it remains within the material, causing catalytic oxidation to continue well after the end of the winter. So it's absorbed into the material. Uh, the outer discs, including the pressure plate itself, are most exposed to external pollution, are usually more susceptible to catalytic oxidation. So it's the outer packs for catalytic, um, catalytic uh, and the inner packs uh, thermal uh, oxidation. I think if I say oxidation another three or four more times, I might just get it. Don't ask me to say catalytic again. Um, the risk of brake rupture, loss of performance and potential uh, brake fire. We'll talk about these fuses in a minute. In addition to high maintenance costs, brake oxidation uh, can can lead to brake rupture and the loss of braking for the affected uh, wheel. If maximum braking is necessary, such as in the case of rejected takeoff or close to the maximum takeoff weight, it may result in an overrun. The rupture uh, can also cause brake pistons uh, damage the brake pistons and lead to the leakage of the hydraulic fluid, which is what we saw uh, in this incident. Uh, the fluid may, <clears throat> excuse me, the fluid may vaporize and create smoke uh, if it comes into contact with the hot components. 
um, this could result in a fire and we we all we know all too well um, the, uh, the we've we studied some events actually in in this series about um, uh, break fires uh, the hydraulic fuses uh, will limit the amount of hydraulic fluid uh, lost and the fire should remain contained to the break area but damage may be caused to nearby components maintenance personnel and flight crews both have a role to play uh, to prevent brake rupture. We'll look at our role in that a little bit later on. Maintenance uh, is, is obvious. So the fuses, these are actually in the um, uh, hydraulic lines themselves. And, excuse me, they're fitted to perform two functions. It's flow rate and also limit uh, fluid loss. Uh, and like I say, they're, they're fitted inside the fluid lines. I may or may not have a picture i've got to be careful here because when you put these things up there some of them are sort of more industrial uh use but um I, I don't i'm not sure that we need to see that when i do the editing i'll have a look and see if it's worth actually doing or not so if you don't see it here i've obviously deemed it's not necessary um but essentially you just need to know that if if, if this happens it's unlikely you're going to lose the entire contents of your hydraulic system uh because you've got these um um these valves in there to limit the, the loss of the hydraulic fluid. Um, now, brake maintenance. There are a number of ways to identify worn brakes and prevent brake rupture. Um, individual checks, inspections, and taking precautions when using de-icing um, and uh, cleaning fluids. Now, we're in that type of year now, aren't we, uh, where we are going to be using de-icing at certain parts of uh, Europe. Uh, despite all this global warming, there are parts of the country that, um, uh, that we are going to be going to during the ski season uh, where uh, we're going to be more prone to using de-icing fluids. It's just something uh, to be uh, aware of. I mean, a lot of this largely we can't control because we're going to have to taxi through this stuff and we leave a lot of it to the de-icing crews uh, to manage this and they have their own uh, operating procedures to prevent uh, the, you know this this uh, this from happening, but I think as always, it's just an, it's just an awareness. Uh, regularly check the brake wear indicator. We can do this, of course, on our walk around. But the um, maintenance planning document (MPD) requires a regular visual inspection of the brake wear indicator to assess the level of thickness of that brake disc and that braking material. Um, the check must be done with the brakes applied. Oh, this is this is all with a with the bite activated. This is all it. If the brake wear indicator is flush with the reference surface, the brake unit must be changed. So um, this is something that we can look. So if you if you go do your walk around and, and you can't see any of that wear indicator protruding through um, the reference plate and it's flush, then you need to talk to the uh, maintenance your main your company maintenance. Um, people uh, uh, to make them uh, aware of it and uh, they obviously will make the decision as to what they do whether the aircraft can be dispatched um, etc uh, what is this uh, 320 um, table 2 here the check must be done the braking applied if the brake wear indicator is flushed with the surface the braking must be changed uh, so the, 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 the interval for checking is on a 320 is six months or every 100 uh, flight cycle. It talks about the A220 brake wear monitoring. I'm not going to discuss that here. Um, best practice to estimate the remaining service time of a brake unit. The average rate or wear rate of one millimeter for every 20 flight cycles can be used. That's quite interesting, isn't it? So the number of flight cycles is an average value can be customized depending on the aircraft operations and aircraft type. So I guess here that the AMM uh, will, your company um, operations and maintenance will have their uh, approved procedure depending on the type of operations you are exposing the aircraft to. I'm not going to discuss the in, uh, inspection of the brakes themselves because we'll never see it. Uh, but there's a nice picture here uh, and some others which I'll include of the signs of oxidization. So this is what the um, your maintenance crew will be looking at. And you can see no sign of oxidation, um, oxidized uh, stator and a highly oxidized uh, brake pad. You, you can see all the debris there around the uh, stators and uh, and on the rotors. Uh, there's a bit here about the AMM for the 320 aircraft. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Some operators are more exposed to the risk 
uh, of brake rupture due to their specific uh, operations. Uh, and I guess that might be short field operations, uh, short se um, uh, multiple sector flights, etc. Whether whether the packs are getting quite hot, um, relatively short taxis, etc. Airbus uh, proposed an optional brake inspection with the wheel removed, and this inspection was developed together with the brake manufacturers and can be added to the AMM procedure. Uh, by request of the operator and some steps were added to the brake inspection procedure that require measuring of the outer perimeter of the central stator and that was um, uh, Safran landing systems and uh, Goodrich uh, brakes blah 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 okay <laughs> blah 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 and that's a technical term uh, that's more of a, a maintenance thing we, we won't uh, we won't see that um, Airbus would cut encourage operators to report any brake damage or rupture through the tech request tool using the brake disc failure reporting uh, sheet. Um, precautions during cleaning and de-icing. When cleaning the aircraft or performing de-icing, particular care should be taken to prevent fluids from coming into contact with the wheels and brakes. Um, always allow for the AMM procedure for cleaning and de-icing to protect the wheels and brakes to prevent them from becoming contaminated with chemicals that will accelerate uh, oxidation which we which we looked at earlier on remember those chemicals uh, are retained in the uh, uh, brake uh, materials well after uh, they've been applied okay so let's um, there's a bit more here about the maintenance procedure I'm not going to go into that now you can read it at your own leisure uh, if you wish uh, operational considerations now again government health warning here please refer to your company procedures as to how they want you to operate the aeroplane uh, because there will be techniques in there to apply which have a trade-off between fuel saving and and uh, brake maintenance it's getting cold now flight crew can detect worn brakes before the flight during the exterior walk around they can uh, reduce uh, wear and oxidation by using the brakes in an optimal manner uh, during taxi and on landing. Okay, so let's get into it now. A quick check of the brake wear indicator, uh, show you that picture here again, during the exterior walk around will determine if the brakes are worn. If they are only a few millimeters remaining before the indicator is flush with the reference plate, uh, inform maintenance personnel to anticipate a plan for brake uh, replacement before the wear limit um, is reached. Yeah, okay, so um, I said, well, it's flush, but if you know, if there's a couple of mil there, then and then inform maintenance to make sure uh, they're uh, aware of it. I'm not too sure how involved you're going to get in that, but making them aware of it, of course, is the priority. Um, reducing brake uh, use during taxi. So the flight crew should reduce the number of brake applications. So it's brake applications that also increase uh, the uh, wear of the uh, brake and, and efficiency during taxi to limit the, limit the brake wear. The FCTM and the A220 FCOM recommend that long straight taxiways with no uh, ATC or other ground con uh, traffic constraints, the PF should allow the aircraft to accelerate to 30 knots of ground speed and then use one smooth uh, brake application to decelerate to 10 knots. I think we're all familiar with that now, but if you wanted to know why the FCOM recommends that and your ops, ops manual recommends that, it is for this reason. It's all to do uh, with brake wear. So on most aircraft, actually, uh, that are relatively light after landing, an idle thrust on a, on a flat, um, a no gradient uh, taxiway, the aircraft will quite easily uh, accelerate to 30 knots, especially if you have uh, engine anti-ice on. And that is something to consider because it really will accelerate very quickly. And it's it's in those circumstances that more brake applications will be required. And it might be because of the, the condition of the taxiway, you might not be able to get to uh, 30 knots so there might be some there might be more brake applications but go to the maximum speed that is permissible on that surface i would say um, would be more accurate 
But anyway, maximum 30, one brake application, bring it back to 10 knots and then allow the aircraft to accelerate again. Single engine taxi is great because it's a fuel saving, uh, enables a reduced number of brake applications to keep the aircraft speed um, below 30 knots. And it may be that you can't use single engine taxi during contaminated taxiways, etc. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, under normal circumstances, dry, clear runways and, and taxiways, Single engine taxi not only saves fuel, uh, but it also re reduces the number of brake applications. Uh, reducing brake energy, uh, did I have anything else on here? Um, yeah, no, that's fine. The number of thermal oxidation reports is increasing, especially on 320 fleet. This phenomenon may be linked with the efforts by many operators, or probably all, uh, to save fuel. It was observed that a majority of operators reporting high thermal oxidation, I'm, I'm getting it, uh, were using config three and thrust reversers on idle uh, at landing. Like I said, there is a trade-off between fuel savings, engine maintenance costs, and increased brake replacement due to higher rates of oxidation. Remember, the higher the temperatures, so flat three is an increase of approach speed of three or four knots, um, idle reverse and um, are all going to increase the uh, ground speed and the energy of the airplane and are, are, and are obviously going to increase uh, the temperature and the likelihood of uh, oxidation. Uh, this will depend on the flight conditions, aircraft condition and the uh, aircraft's uh, operating uh, policy. So again, this is all to do with the trade-off in costs. And I suspect if fuel's very, very expensive and brakes are relatively cheap, uh, then you know, the flat three and um, uh, approaches uh, are, are gonna be, uh, an, an idle reverse uh, are going to be more of a consideration because of fuel costs and engine maintenance costs. But if brakes suddenly uh, start to go through the roof, uh, then you know the company might decide to change that plan. So uh, that comes back to your ops at the end of the day. The use of flat full at landing reduces the approach speed, sorry, uh, and therefore the aircraft energy to be absorbed by the brakes. We've already uh, covered that. Again, this is cost of brakes um, uh, comparison. The use of auto brake enables single brake application with an optimized braking intensity. When auto brake is used, and if the conditions permit, the use of the auto brake low reduces the heat of the brakes and therefore reduces the likelihood of oxidation. So auto brake low is a great little tool. Um, it, it reduces the, the amount of energy going into the brakes. It is a single uh, application, so it reduces brake wear. And of course, it reduces the temperature because there's less energy going into the brakes. And so it reduces uh, oxidation. So, um, you know, very long runways, uh, a high speed exit, uh, an appropriate high speed exit, um, you know, you can use all the initiatives. You've got flat three um, and uh, you've got low uh, uh, auto brake, idle reverse, long exit taxiway, great for fuel uh, and uh, arguably uh, great for brakes um, as well. Uh, there's an article, a little bit of the article here which talks about the uh, uh, updated auto brake low for the A320 aircraft. It's worth just reviewing that again because we haven't covered this in a while. An update auto brake low mode with a slightly uh, increased deceleration rate of 2 uh, meters per second squared uh, instead of the 1.7 and a shorter delay of the application 2 seconds instead of 4 seconds. So that's in line with auto brake medium was introduced on uh, A320 aircraft. This updated low mode enables use of low mode on shorter runways and reduces the observed tendency of the flight crew to switch to manual braking due to a perception uh, of late order brake application. So that was an important tool here, again, to help um, with um, brake energy or, or uh, brake degradation. This updated order brake mode is installed in 320 aircraft delivered since Q2 2018 and can be retrofitted on uh, earlier, earlier aircraft. So that, so one is a slightly increased deceleration rate to help use order brake low on shorter performance, uh, short field uh, aircraft or shorter field aircraft uh, uh, runways and, um, and also commence the deceleration at two seconds rather than four seconds uh, to um, uh, start that braking earlier to override that temptation um, or to reduce that temptation for the crew to override the brakes, um, uh, again, increasing uh, brake wear. So an effort there by Airbus to try and help operators reduce 
uh, the uh, the break where single application of the break uh, lower um, temperature uh, of the brakes less need to override the brakes uh, helping with uh, brake wear. I think I've done that to death now. Uh, another thing we can do is a timely thrust reduction during the flare that we know we need to totally retard the thrust levers to idle at 20 feet on the 320. A timely thrust reduction during the landing flare prevents extra thrust being provided by the order thrust trying to maintain the approach in the flare. The target, uh, the flight crew should retard the thrust levers at 20 feet on the 320 as per the SOP and at the latest at landing gear touchdown. Again, this is to prevent any excess energy being carried during the uh, landing roll for obvious reasons. The use of thrust reverse reduces the energy to be absorbed by the brakes. It's therefore a good option to use thrust reverse reverses to limit brake oxidation, especially uh, on, on short runways. But um, again, there are a few places where you actually need to use maximum reverse. Uh, this will reduce brake energy, but it's just an increase in engine wear on the components and of course fuel. So again, this is all about uh, offset, but um, thrust reverse landing are obviously gonna reduce brake energy. And the most appropriate runway exit, uh, taking over the order brake uh, to use full or strong manual braking to quickly slow down the aircraft or to reach a specific runway exit may save some taxi time. However, it will also significantly increase brake wear. Using the next exit may slightly increase the taxi time, but will also reduce brake wear and uh, temperature. So think about that when you're uh, planning your exits. The use of brake fans, uh, there's some guidance here in the uh, FCOM, but the use of cooling fans when available reduces the exposure time of the brakes to high temperatures uh, after landing, and this reduces the effects of carbon thermal oxidation um good uh, something to think about in your turnaround times well particularly if they're relatively short you need to bring those temperatures down uh, but you might find that your company want you to wait about five minutes if you can um uh before coming uh, on to stand but make sure that the brake fans are applied ideally before you get onto stand uh, so you don't blow all that carbon dust all over the ground crew that carbon dust only blows out when the fans initially come on. So once that's done, uh, the ground crew uh, will be safe. Guys, that pretty much concludes it. I'm just gonna read the summary here and then that's the briefing uh, over with. The maximum available braking performance is necessary to prevent the risk of runway overrun in the event of a rejected takeoff with a fully uh, loaded aircraft, obviously. Brakes need to be closely monitored to ensure that they do not have excessive wear or oxidation. Got it again. Um, that will affect the braking performance of the aircraft or to ensure that they do not degrade to a condition that could cause a brake rupture, similar to the one that we saw early on. Flight crew or maintenance personnel can quickly check the brake wear uh, during the exterior walk around by looking at that uh, pin uh, refer to the reference plate, uh, by looking at the brake wear indicator pin on each brake unit. There's more than one, remember, uh, top and bottom. If the indicator is flush with the reference plate or below it, the brake must be changed. Um, it's important to perform a careful inspection of the brake assembly at every wheel removal to check for signs of excessive oxidation. Ding! Operators should consider adding the optimal inspection check uh, developed with the brake manufacturer into their AMM. Uh, flight crews can apply a number of recommended uh, procedures and techniques to help reduce the rates of brake wear and oxidation. Ding! Uh, this includes reducing the number of brake applications during taxi, we mentioned earlier, applying techniques that will reduce the brake energy at landing, and using brake fans when available. Uh, these operational and maintenance considerations will ensure that the brakes have a longer service life and help you when you really need them and are in a condition to create the necessary friction for optimal aircraft braking performance. That, ladies and gents, concludes uh, the article uh, from uh, Airbus Safety First. Take care of your brakes. Um, got any questions? Also, always put them in the comments or get in touch directly um, uh, through uh, Facebook uh, page uh, where I post all these videos anyway. Uh, you can personal message or DM, whatever you call it, uh, if there's any uh, specific questions that you want. Uh, obviously, I prefer to keep them out on the channel because then everyone can see them. But equally, if there's anything you want to see or clarification on, uh, then again, uh, please do get in touch. 
any problems with the member side of the channel um, YouTube has started to introduce some gra geographical uh, restrictions in certain parts of the certain parts of the world um, you can bypass that uh, by using a VPN uh, so if you've got any problems uh, you've got the membership you can't see the content then um, try using a VPN and that will uh, that will hopefully um, uh, alleviate that uh, problem for you thanks very much for watching uh, stay safe keep the plate spinning and I'll see you uh, for another episode uh, very soon thanks very much